pray together. Would you bow with me? God, I thank you for your grace, your favor upon your people. And I wanna pray this morning that we would experience you afresh in this place. I, I wanna pray once again today that you would challenge us and convict us. I pray that you would minister hope and peace and joy and strength, God, to a people who come here, maybe today weary, but I pray you would strengthen the weary today, God. I wanna pray that in everything that is spoken here today, that the name of Jesus, that name that is above every other name, may that name and that name only be honored in this place. And I pray that as we lift you up, that you would draw us nearer to yourself, that we may experience you personally in this place today. And God, I pray that you would fill your people here with a sense of hope and joy in knowing you and walking with you. So take my lips now and speak through them. May this be about what you want to say to us, not about what I have to say. Certainly, God, we honor you today. We thank you in Jesus' name. And all of New Life said, say it, New Life. I invite you to be seated. It is great to see you all here today. And if you're joining us online, we welcome you. Uh, you know, I just, uh, we're gonna be talking a lot in the weeks to come about our vision as a church and the things that are happening this fall. Pastor Greg was talking about some of that this morning on the video. And I wanna tell you what is at the heart of the vision of our church. You ready for this? Jesus. That's the heart of the vision of our church. What we do, we do for and about Jesus Christ. Everything that we say, every time we gather, every song that we sing, every time that we come together for unity and community, it is for and about the person of Christ. That's the way we operate. We are not a country club. We're not a social scene, although we, I guess we are a social scene. We're not a social club. But we come together in the name of Jesus. It's all about him and it's all about his gospel. The good news that Christ came to extend grace to us what I want to talk to you about this morning. And incidentally, this message and this song we just sang, we did not talk about this today, all right? But the Holy Spirit has matched this up so perfectly, talking today about the grace of God. I actually, uh, I have a theory this year that more people are traveling than ever before. And I realized that because a few weeks ago, I went with my daughter up to Boston and I went to the Pittsburgh airport to park in long-term parking. I couldn't find a place to park which never happens. It was just absolutely jammed with cars. And uh, we actually, a number of years ago, went on a vacation together, our, all five of our kids, my wife and me, in a minivan. If you can picture this, we finally had a minivan and it had a little television screen in it. And we had like 40 episodes of Get Smart that we watched the whole way down to Florida, which was incredible and we'll never forget it. But we stopped on the way at a place called Blue Spring State Park in Orange City, Florida. And if you ever have a chance to go there, it's a place, if you go at the right time, you can swim with the manatees. You just gotta make sure you're not swimming with the crocodiles, all right, or the alligators. But there is a pool of water there. I mentioned this a couple years ago in a message that is so beautiful. It's incredible. I think we have a picture of some water here. Can we bring that up? Kind of looks like that. It, it is a cave that goes straight down. And coming from that cave is this stream of warm water, so blue. And it's so crystal clear that you can see way down inside this giant hole in the ground. It's just filled with just the, the, the most amazing warm water. But the day we were there, uh, when we went with the family on that vacation, it was Memorial Day, and there was a bunch of other people there, dozens of people. And there happened to be a tree that had fallen over that body of water. This giant tree had fallen and if you could picture this, it was leaning against a cliff. And there were some people there, there were some rednecks there that were climbing up that tree, shimmying up that tree, it was like at an angle, to a height that was probably about as high as this gray facade above the platform here. And to the applause of their family standing below, yeah, they were dropping down into that pool of water. And you guessed it, after observing this for a period of time, I was just redneck enough to try it. And I began to shimmy up and it wasn't to applause. It was to like, dad, don't get hurt because we're trying to go to Disney World tomorrow. So don't mess this up. I shimmied my way up that tree to realize once you got up there, man, it was a lot higher than what you thought. And I'm like, I had second thoughts. There was no coming down. You could not shimmy back down the tree. It wasn't gonna happen. Eventually had to let go. 
and fall into that water. And I don't know if you know that moment when you were submerged in beautiful water. This was fresh water, it wasn't salt water. What that, what that feels like, just floating beneath the water, silent. That water just penetrating every pore in your body. You know, you know that feeling of just being, I could go for that right now, just being kind of immersed in beautiful water. And, and I, I say that today and I tell you that story because I, I, I want you to not settle for a shallow view of who God is. I want to encourage you today, I don't know what your spiritual depth might be, but I want to encourage you today to go deeper than you have ever gone before. To reach out for God and go deeper with him than you ever got before. To not settle for a shallow relationship with God. And I'm afraid that far too many people sit in churches around the world with a very shallow vision for who God is and a very shallow relationship with him. But today, here at New Life, I want to encourage you to go deeper, to take that risk, to take that step and and plumb the depths of that relationship that God offers us to experience the joy and the hope and the power that comes with walking in a deep relationship with Almighty God. I wanna talk to you today about one giant step. You ready for this? This is big now. And you may have heard this before. I don't know if you've experienced it. This is huge. It's a prerequisite. You know what I mean by prerequisite? This is required. If you're really gonna go deep with God, you have to grab hold of this concept. It's one of the central themes of all of the Bible. It is one word. And I want you to dive into this word today. And it's this word right here, grace. Grace. One syllable. My daughter's name is Grace, by the way. Because it is so powerful. And it affects every area of your life. There's so many layers and applications to this idea of the grace of God that I don't think we can ever completely comprehend what it really means. But I want to try to put it in human terms this morning because I believe that when you grasp this, it will change your life. I want to show you some definitions that come from the Bible dictionary I have on my desk. Here's here's the definitions of grace. And actually in Greek, the word is charis. All right. And it, it actually means this, unmerited favor. In other words, you have God's favor. I don't know if you realize that or not. Not that you deserve it. Not that any of us deserve it because we're all sinners. Saved by what? Grace. It's God. You are favored by God. Do you understand? That's what God's grace literally means. Unmerited favor. I don't deserve it. But yes, I'm living in the favor of God. And here's another definition. The empowering presence of God in your lives. God's action on behalf of his people. That's grace. The divine influence upon your heart and upon your life. It is the grace of God and it it flows. It flows from the goodness of our God. We just sang about it. The grace of our God. I wanna plumb the depths of that today with you for just a few minutes because I believe it will change your life. And even though you may have been in church for many years, you may have never really been able to grasp what it means to live in the grace of God. If you came here today thinking that you can't go on, and maybe you did, I came here today to tell you that by his grace, God will sustain you through whatever it is you are going through. When God calls you, and maybe he's calling you to something bigger than yourself, something you know that you cannot handle in and of yourself, by his grace, you will prevail. In fact, we sometimes say, I'm gonna get through this just by the grace of God. Maybe we mean it, maybe we don't, but it's true. We need not be hindered by the external. We're children of the living God, living in the grace of God. We need not be deterred by our circumstances or driven by emotion because we are living in the favor of the unlimited God. That's his grace. 
And I want you to grasp that this morning because people have come here to church today and you've convinced yourselves or maybe Satan has convinced you that God can't use you, that somehow you're less than other people. And this Christian faith is not really for you. Maybe you feel like you failed too many times and you've been disqualified. I came here today to tell you that God knew all about your failures before you even failed. The God who knows the future, and yet he still extends his grace to us. And I wanna say this to you today, brothers and sisters and friends in our church family here, your quality of life, the human experience, the quality of it hinges, I believe, on how well you understand this concept of God's grace. It is so powerful. Incidentally, your eternal destiny hinges on what this word represents. The Apostle Paul, who we've been talking about here over the last several weeks, wrote about it so vividly. And this is actually in Ephesians 2. He talks about saving grace. For it is by grace you have been saved. Can I read that one more time just to make sure I have that right? It is by what? Say it again. You have been saved. Just by his grace. Through faith. And this is not from yourselves. So listen, don't think too highly of yourself because guess what? You're saved only by grace. It is the gift of God. And when you think about a gift, you know what a gift is? It's when someone gives you something and they don't expect anything in return. It's just a gift God has given you. He gave it to you through the cross. A gift and he expects nothing in return. It's just unmerited favor upon us. It's nothing we could do for ourselves lest any man should boast, but it's by the grace of our God that we have been saved. I want you to think about it this way in this metaphor. Can we bring that water pick back up here one more time? Here it is. That's the water, all right? That water is grace. It represents grace this morning. We, we exist in his grace. We're immersed in his grace. Grace is like the water at Blue Spring State Park. And faith is when you decide to let go of the branch and really go deep with God, to take that step. Some of you have never taken that step. You've given lip service to your relationship with God, to church, to what you might call religion, but oh, I want to tell you, there is something so much more, something so much richer and so much, if I dare say it, deeper. And we find it in the grace of our God. This word grace, charis in Greek, is perhaps the most important word in the Bible, if you're a student of the Bible. In fact, in the New International Version, that, that in the New Testament, that word appears 131 times. It's one of the reoccurring threads woven through the entirety of the New Testament. And in fact, other forms of that same word that are sometimes translated gracious appear another 46 times. So we see some version of this word in the New Testament 177 times. I think God's telling us something. In the Old Testament, there's a different word that's translated favor. And we see that word, usually from Hebrew, 105 times. It has been God's will to show you favor and to show you grace since before you were created and before the beginning of this world. And as we read the New Testament, what we find is when we look at the words of Jesus, in the translations I study of the Bible, Jesus never says the word grace. You can go through and check it for yourself. He never says grace, but he demonstrates grace in every single thing that he does. In every conversation, every miracle, and everything Jesus does, he demonstrates grace. The woman caught in sin in the Gospel of John, if you remember that story, what she deserved, according to the, the Jewish law, was death. And that's exactly what these people were going to do. They were going to stone this woman until Jesus shows up, intercedes on her behalf, and tells her, go and sin no more, and extends to her Grace, it's what he did. It's what he demonstrates at the woman at the well. 
who was promiscuous and was so ashamed that she wouldn't even come to the well when other people came and was probably under so much condemnation from other people. But she goes one day and who does she run into but the son of a living God who extends to her something no one else would or could and it was grace. Changes her life. The demoniac who was inhabited by a thousand demons. No one could control this guy. He was living outside of society, in a cemetery. And yet Jesus shows up and extends this poor soul, to this poor soul, grace. He never says the word, but he demonstrates it. And here's what John says in John 1. It says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. That's Jesus becoming a man. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son. No one like him who came from the father full of what? full of grace and truth, grace and truth. And many people have preached this many different ways, but I just want us to see today what the Bible says. Grace, this relentless, ongoing, powerful grace, the grace of God. You know, some people treat grace as a license to sin. Like, I'm living in the age of grace. I can do whatever I want to do, and God will forgive me. That, that's the road to destruction right there. Because Jesus is grace. He's filled with grace, full of grace, but he's also full of truth. You know what truth is? Truth is living life with a set of beliefs that we know are true. And that truth is Christ. And with that, we have standards that we live by. See, as people, we live in grace, but we need parameters, amen? I, I need someone to tell me how to live my life. And that someone is Christ. We need grace, but we also need truth. We need call to obedience. Listen, what is God calling you to change about your behavior today? Is there something in your life? Because I would tell you that we are all sinners. I'm not being judgmental here today, I'm being honest. As a church family, let's be honest. All of us have fallen short of God's glory. What in your life today has been blemishing you for far too long and you want to experience God, but there's some sin, some pattern of behavior that has held you back and it's time to confess that and repent and really walk with God. Someone might say, well, you know what? I pretty much walk with God. You know, I'm pretty, I'm pretty honest, but I'm a pretty good person. You hear that? Guess what? There's none good. We're all sinners. And, and before you think for a moment that you're doing pretty well in walking in obedience, and I'm glad you are, and maybe you've been able to clean your life up, and I hope you have, and I hope that happens here in this church, but I want to tell you, if you're walking in obedience to God, you're only doing it by the grace of God. Amen? It's not anything that I could do. It's what he gives to me. It's by his grace. And when you take grace and you put truth together with it, you know what you have? Christ. You have Jesus. It's not just theology. But today I want that to penetrate your soul. The Apostle Paul that we've been talking about here for several weeks was the picture of grace, an example, a testimony to God's grace. He was also known as Saul of Tarsus, the Pharisee, a harsh persecutor of the church, bully, judgmental, pious, brutal, stalker, murderer. This guy didn't deserve any grace, probably as far as other people were concerned. He deserved to be put in his place. This guy tortured innocent people. And he's heading to Damascus to victimize and imprison innocent Christians when Jesus shows up on that road and extends to this person who was so far from God, grace. And it changes everything. That same God today extends grace to each one of us. He was the least likely to ever be God's person. Didn't deserve it. But he was saved by grace. But you know, grace is not just the 
the power of God to save me. We are saved by grace. We're saved by grace. But he also gives us a grace to endure. I I, I want you to think about this for a moment. When I climbed up that tree that day, and I wasn't gonna mention this, but I'll mention it today, because we're all friends, right? I shimmied up that tree that day, and I dropped down into that water. You know the one thing I forgot? There was a cell phone in one of the pockets. I mean, I'm telling you, I mean, you don't think less of me. I don't know if you've ever done anything like that. But see, here was the problem with it. We only owned one cell phone at the time. And that cell phone contained a phone number from my cousin, who I had not seen in years, who worked for Disney. And he had the tickets to get us into Disney the next day. Now, think about the, the problems that that creates right there. Because we had no idea how to get a hold of him. His entire family lived in Florida. He was the only phone number I had. I didn't know his address. I didn't know anything about how to get a hold of him. So even though I've been saved by grace, I'm living in grace, it doesn't mean that there aren't gonna be issues. And it might not be cell phone issues. It might be health issues. It might be relationship issues. It might be job issues. Life is not gonna be perfect. But God not only saves us by grace, he also gives us this, grace to endure. Grace to endure. And Paul says this, even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. No one knows exactly what that thorn in the flesh was. Might have been a vision problem, might have been some kind of physical ailment. But here's what we do know. Paul says three different times, I begged the Lord. You ever beg God for something? God, I'm begging you. He begged the Lord. This is God's man right here, the apostle. He begged the Lord to take it away. And God responded. He said each time he said, my grace is all you Need. We read that sometimes we think, boy, that's a very small consolation, God. But I want to tell you, there's nothing bigger than the grace of God. There's nothing more powerful than the grace of our God. He says, my power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses. Anybody here able to boast about their weaknesses? I mean, I just admitted that I jumped in with a cell phone in my pocket. I don't know if that's boasting in my weaknesses. Maybe boasting in stupidity. I'm not sure. But he boasts in his weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. That's powerful. That's the impact of grace upon a person. The same God who said, to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is enough for you. Today says that same thing to you and me. The ongoing dynamic with God Almighty. By his grace, I'm enabled. I'm empowered. I'm struck with the realization that, yeah, life might not be perfect, but guess what? I have God's favor. I have God working in my life. I have God with a purpose and a plan for me. God's empowering presence in your life, in spite of the issues that you came in here dealing with today, the overwhelming sense, God is with me. And that is not gonna change. So how do I do what I do? How do I walk through the hard things? I wanna tell you that grace is gratuitous. And what that means really ultimately is, the only reason you are here today is by the grace of God. The only reason that you even exist today is because of the grace of an infinite God. The only reason that you're drawing breath is because of him. And if you find strength in your weakness, I'm telling you, it's because of the grace of God. If you go from brokenness to restoration in your life, and I pray that you do, I'm telling you it's gonna be by the grace of God. If you go from addiction to sobriety, there's nothing in that that you can take credit for because it's all by his grace. We are nothing without his grace. Darkness into light, by his grace. The empowering agent, the Holy Spirit, instigating God's will in your life, working in you and through you. 
He gives you the grace to navigate temptation. And some of you are dealing with big time temptation right now. He will give you the grace to navigate that temptation, to deal with the issues you deal with by the grace of God, by God's power working in you. Caring for aging parents, some of you are doing that. I know exactly how that is. I'm telling you, you'll get through it by the grace of God. It may be more than you can do or more than you can take to take care of that sick child that you are dealing with right now, but I'm telling you that God is with you. You get through it through the grace of God. Navigating a difficult career by the grace of God. So I wanna give you a prayer. I mean, just think about this. Praying to God. God, give me grace. Give me your favor. Give me your power at work in my life because I can't do it in and of myself, God, and I need to draw it from you. And I need you to give me your grace, even though I don't deserve it, God. I just pray your favor and blessing upon me. There are people that have come here today and you have a history. The Apostle Paul had a history. You've walked in here today with baggage, with regrets, with shame, because you have a history. And I want you to see today that Paul had a history as well. Here's what he said in 1 Corinthians 15. For I'm the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. He brutalized the church. He hurt people. And maybe you've hurt people. I don't know what your past is. Maybe people hurt you. Maybe you rejected people or you were rejected by people. Maybe you've made a lot of mistakes in that process and maybe you've given up hope and maybe people have even written you off. I'm sure they wrote the Apostle Paul off. He didn't even deserve to be called an apostle. But by the grace, can you say grace? By the grace of God, I am what I am. He's the apostle. And, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, all the other apostles. He didn't just sit around and wait for God to do something. He actually got out. Yes, not I, but what? But the grace of God that was with me. That same grace is with you today. The grace of God. God gave me something I never deserved. His favor, his presence in my life. Because without it, I'm never worthy. Without it, I'm never good enough. Without it, I'll never measure up because I'm a fallen sinner. I've fallen short, but by his grace, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. It totally changes everything, grace. And I begin to see, and my prayer is that you begin to see yourself under the heading of grace. Not judgment or condemnation, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But we see ourselves under the heading of God's favor and God's grace. God, I'm nothing without you. That's why I put all my confidence in you. And I can do nothing without you, but with you I can do all things. And when that happens, and when you begin to shift in that way, and when you begin to see yourself under the heading of God's amazing grace, Satan might as well get a plane ticket because your life will change and God will change you and use you in ways that he hasn't before. God's divine favor. Is it perfect? Is life perfect when you're living in his grace? No. Some people are waiting for the next phase of life. You ever been there? I just can't wait till I get out of school get into that next phase. I can't wait till you get out of this job or that, whatever. I can't wait till I can move out of this place. You know, and then everything is gonna be great. Listen, God wants you to experience his grace right now. Wherever you might be, that you may know the joy right now. How does that happen? I want you to know today that grace is not stagnant. That God wants you to grow in grace. Have you heard that in the Bible before? God wants you to grow in grace. Now get this. Let's see what, in 2 Peter 3, Peter begins to talk about Paul. All right, now get this. 2 Peter 3, verse 15. 
Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. Just as our dear brother Paul, this is Peter talking about Paul, also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand. Tell me about it. That's why we do Bible studies, trying to understand what God spoke through the apostle Paul. And he says, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. And I want you to notice something here, that this word scriptures is used to describe the writings of the apostle Paul. Before there was a Bible like you know it, Peter was describing the writings of Paul as scriptures. Is that amazing? Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position. Doesn't mean you're gonna lose your salvation, but what he's saying is, listen, don't go back to your old life. Don't backslide. You know, don't get discouraged. Don't give up. You know, don't have a pity party. Look at the next verse, verse 18. But grow. Grow in what? Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You mean, God, you want me to grow in this area of grace? To him be glory both now and forevermore. When you are tempted to give in to sin, when you are tempted to be discouraged, when you are tempted to fall back into addiction, he's given us an alternative, and that is this. Grow in the grace of the Lord. Begin to see yourself under the heading of grace. Now, God, how does that happen? How do I begin to see myself that way? I want to give you three ways, and I'm going to let you go to brunch, all right? You ready for this? Write this down, type it in, text yourself, lock this in. I want to give you three things directly from the Scripture of how to grow in grace. And here it is. Here's the first one. Humility. James writes this, and he gives grace generously. As the Scriptures say, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Boy, I don't want God to oppose me. You know, pride is the original sin of Satan. Back in the garden, I'm going to be like God. It's about me. I'm number one. That's pride. You show me pride, I'll show you destruction. In a family, in a group of people, in the life of a person, ultimately, it's pride. But you show me humility, and I'll show you power. You know, the way up in the kingdom of God is down. We have people that come in and want to do things here in the church, want to be in leadership. It begins by scrubbing the bathrooms. You know what I mean? Sometimes it begins by just doing the small things to walk in humility because the way up is down in the kingdom of God. To, be, to experience the grace of God, it begins with humility. And how are we doing with that today? Humility. So, verse seven, humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. He's talking about repentance here. You know, to really come and repent of our sin takes humility. To really admit that we were wrong takes humility. To come before God and say, God, forgive me. A sinner, just saved by grace. Forgive me. You know what the world would say? Promote yourself. Make a name for yourself. Here's what God's word says in verse 10. Humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. He opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So if we humble ourselves in due time, he's gonna raise us up, demonstrate his grace to us. That's the first thing, humility. All right, ask yourself that question. How am I doing with humility today, really? Here's the second thing, generosity. The Apostle Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 9, but this I say, 
He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. That word cheerful there could be translated hilarious. Like when I just struck with the idea of giving something to someone. There's joy. It's not like I'm gonna grit my teeth. You mean the church wants me to give something? Really? Okay, you know, no, but there's joy in it. There's joy in it. Verse eight, and there's the conjunction, and God is able to make what? All grace abound toward you. Does that mean you're giving to receive? No, and I would never preach that. But here's what God's word says, that all grace will abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. That's God's word there. It's an attitude and an atmosphere of generosity. And there are many people that are listening to my voice say, you'll never know that side of grace because you, you're not a giver. And you never experience the joy of giving to God's work or helping someone else or finding an opportunity to be generous with someone who needs. We need to walk around in life looking for opportunities to be generous. If we really want to experience the grace of God and grow in the grace of God, giving, generosity. We were actually, um, this past week, uh, up in Massachusetts. This is like, this is actually a few weeks ago. And we're walking along and this young man came up to me, pretty well dressed. And he just said, listen, I'm an alcoholic. I've been kicked out of my halfway house. I'm on my way to a 12 steps meeting and I'm finding myself homeless in Boston. I have nowhere to go. And my my first instinct is to think, yeah, and there's 10 other people that are saying the same thing. But I turned to my wife, I didn't know what to do. I thought about walking away from this guy and I handed my wallet to my wife and I said, go on ahead. I didn't want this guy to steal my wallet. I said, go on ahead, I'll catch up with you. And she did. And I I stood there and, and I talked to this kid and I began to realize that he was there to teach me something more than for me to give him something because I was preparing for this message. And I had an opportunity and I don't want to just steal the blessing there, but I had an opportunity to help this guy a little bit. I, didn't, I really don't carry much cash on me anymore. But I thought, God has given me an opportunity here to be generous. And I'm not saying you go out and give to everyone who asks. But looking for those opportunities. He says, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly, but if you sow bountifully, you're going to reap bountifully. And you're going to experience God causing grace to abound in your life. There's a blessing that comes in giving. Humility, generosity, and here's the last one. Approach God with confidence. Hebrews 4.16, let us therefore come boldly, you say boldly, to the throne of grace. Hey, you're a child of God. And because you're a child of God, you can live with an expectation that God is gonna continue to be with you and guide you and direct you in your life so we can come to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find what? And find grace to help in time of need. Listen, Christian, you can come confidently before the Lord. I think many times we miss that, that you are sons and daughters of the living God. God, stop depending on emotions. Stop depending on other people's opinions. Come expectantly before the Lord and just ask Him with confidence and you will find grace to help in time of need. And and, and I wanna tell you, when I jumped off there that day with that cell phone, I was like, oh my goodness, now I gotta tell my family, how are we gonna get into Disney World? What's gonna happen? You ever ask that question? What's gonna happen? And we were able to get to a pay phone. You remember pay phones, like put coins in them? I don't even know if that's even out there anymore. And we were able to call, I called back to Pennsylvania and got a relative of somebody and they found out and got a phone number. And eventually we did get to Disney World. 
And I wanna tell you today, whatever you're going through, you're gonna get there because God is with you and God has a future for you. And I'm not saying it's all gonna be easy, but God has an eternity for you. And I believe wants to bless you in the land of the living today to experience the grace, the favor, the power of God at work in your life. You know, my mom passed away last week and I, I just was so encouraged by the many people from the church that have reached out to my family and, and, and have really blessed us. And, and my mom, she, she was a believer. She lived under the grace of God. She, she knew Jesus. And when she drew her last breath last Wednesday at 9 a.m., her next breath was a breath of heavenly air. When she closed her eyes, my mom and I were very close. She's 93 years old. When she closed her eyes in death for the very last time, when she opened them again, the next face she saw was the face of Jesus Christ. Because to be absent from the body is to be with the Lord. But I wanna tell you that only happened by the grace of God because it's really all about grace. Grace for salvation, grace to endure, grace to live. And I wanna encourage you in that today. Today that you would walk humbly before the Lord and look for opportunities to be generous and as a child of God to come boldly before our Lord and Savior.